Chapter 6, Standard Deviation and the Normal Model. I want to start off this chapter with an example. So let's say we have a college deciding between two students for one admission spot during the fall semester. Their applications are identical, with the exception that student A took the SAT and scored a 1380, while student B took the ACT and scored a 31. Which student should the college accept? Obviously, we don't have enough information. Okay, so some other things that we might want to know are what's the possible ranges for these SAT and ACT scores? We probably know that SAT scores are out of 1600. We may not know ACT scores are out of 36. Okay, so both of those scores are um, approaching those upper ranges, but not quite there. Okay, it's also probably helpful to know uh, what the average score of both these tests are. SAT scores average around 1060. ACT scores average around 21. Okay, still we don't have enough information. The thing that we're missing is the standard deviation. We need to know how spread out uh, the distribution of scores are for both of these tests. Okay, and once we have that, we can take each student's score and do something called standardize the score. When we standardize a score, we create something called a z-score. And this is our equation right here. So we have x, which is our data value, minus x bar. Anytime we have a, a variable that has a line on top of it, like that x bar does, we're talking about the average of that variable divided by the standard deviation of that variable. Okay? A z-score tells us how far a certain data value is, this is supposed to be an arrow here, uh, from the mean, how far that x value is from the mean of all the x's and measured in standard deviations. Okay, these are called standardized values. They have no units. A negative z-score would tell us that a data value is below the mean. A positive z-score would tell us that that data value is above the mean. Let's go back to the example. We have two students and what they scored on each of their tests. We know the mean score of each of their tests. And here we have the standard devi deviation of each. Standard deviation for the SAT is 195. Standard deviation for the ACT is 5.4. So now we can use that z-score equation to find a z-score for each of these students. So let's do student A first. So we always take the data value that we're trying to find the z-score for. So 1380, that comes first. We subtract the mean of 1060. And that's going to get divided by the standard deviation. 195. Okay, it gives us a z-score of, uh, let's go to two decimal places for z-scores, so 1.64. Okay, same thing for student B. Z-score for student B, take that data value, subtract the mean of 21, and divide by that standard deviation 5.4. And we get a z-score of 1.85. All right, so what do these two things tell us? So a z-score is telling us how far a data value is from the mean measured in standard deviations. First off, these are both positive, so both of these test scores are above the mean. They're both above average. Since student B has a higher z-score, their test score was farther above average than student A's. Okay, so relatively speaking, this was a better test score than the SAT score. Okay, so all other things being equal, the college should accept student B. Sometimes you'll be working with a data set and you'll be asked questions as to what happens when you start shifting the data set or scaling the data set. So to define some terminology to start, when we're talking about summary statistics, we're talking about things like the mean, median, range, standard deviation, etc. All right. Uh, when we talk about shifting the data, we're talking about adding or subtracting the same number to every value. Scaling would be multiplying or dividing. So let's say in our first example, we have these four numbers, 10, 20, 30, and 50. We see our summary statistics right below it, uh, at least the mean, median, range, and standard deviation. Okay, And to start off, we're going to add 100 to all of those numbers, and those numbers are going in the middle column. Okay. Unsurprisingly, we see that the mean also increases by 100. The median increases by 100 as well. Okay, but the measure now those are both measures of center. Okay, any measure of center or measure of location is going to increase by 100. So quartiles would increase by 100. Minimum and maximum would increase by 100. Measures of spread are not going to increase by 100 because these numbers are not any more spread out. 
we think about the range, uh, there's still 40 between them. They're equally spread out, so the standard deviation isn't going to change. The IQR wouldn't change, etc. Okay, now let's take these numbers and let's say we scaled them. So we're going to take these and we're going to multiply them by two, and we're going to put them in that third column. Okay, so now if we look at the mean, all right, the mean doubles just like all those numbers did. Same thing with the median, okay? And along with that, these numbers are now twice as far in terms of their spread. They're twice as spread out as they were originally. So along with the measures of center and location getting twice as big, the measures of spread also get twice as big, okay? So the point of this slide is that when we shift data, okay, if we add or subtract a number, then and we do it to every number in the data set. Measures of center and location change with that shift, but measures of spread don't, okay? If we scale data, everything changes. So here's an example applying what was on that previous slide. In 1995, the SAT verbals test had a mean of 450. Part A is asking, how would adding 50 points to each score affect the mean? On the previous slide, we saw that that would increase the mean by 50 and it would switch it to 500. Standard deviation was 100 points. What would the standard deviation be after adding 50 points? Okay, the distribution wouldn't be any more spread out by adding 50 points to every score. It's the same amount of spread as it was originally, so the standard deviation is still 100 points. Suppose we drew box plots of test taker scores a year before and a year after the recentering, how the two years differ. It would be the same box plot, it would just be shifted up. 50 points, okay? So it would be likely uh, we just took that box plot and we shifted it to the right 50 points. A bit more about z-scores. Z-scores are nice because it allows us to compare different things. For example, we just had those two students who took two different tests and we were still able to make a determination about which student was quote unquote better, despite the fact that the two tests had different means, different standard deviations, etc. In fact, using z-scores, we we're able to compare an apple with an orange because we're not comparing them directly. We're comparing the apple with respect to where it lies in relation to the mean weight of all apples and the standard deviation of all apples. Same thing with the oranges. Okay, so a z-score again is just telling us how far a data value is from the mean measured in standard deviations. So when a z-score is zero, that's telling us that that data value is exactly equal to the mean. If we have a z-score of one, it's one standard deviation of the mean, it's above the mean if it's positive. If it's negative one, it's one standard deviation below the mean. When it comes to a big z-score, there's really no standard, but the, the number that we'll use throughout the course is that once we hit a z-score of two, that's unusual, quote unquote. Anything past two, at two or above, uh, is where occurrences uh, tend to be rare. To give you a visual representation of where these rare z-scores actually occur, we're going to take a look at a bell-shaped curve. This is just a unimodal and symmetric curve. It's idealized by what's called a normal model. And this is something that occurs uh, in the real world all around us all the time. If we were to take the heights of all the staff members at our school, or the weights of all the inmates at the county jail, or find uh, a couple hundred acorns and measure their widths, we would find bell-shaped distributions for all of them. There's an average for each of those distributions, and as we move away from that average, it gets less and less likely. We're really unlikely to find data values that are far from those averages uh, in either direction. So the normal model is just that perfect bell shape, and in a normal model, if we move out one standard deviation from that average, we're gonna find that 68% of our data lies within that range of one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below the mean. If we move out two standard deviations, that's gonna encompass 95% of the data, okay? So anything past that, there's only 5% left and that's on both sides, is unusual. And if we move out three standard deviations, we're now covering 99.7% of our data. Almost everything is within three standard deviations of the mean in a normal distribution. Okay, and here we see it. Uh, so the mean, again, is right in the middle here. That's the z-score of zero, okay? This is the symbol for standard deviation of a population. So this would be one standard deviation away, and we can see there's 68% of the data is in that middle hump there, okay? Two standard deviations is 95%, and then pretty much everything is in, within three standard deviations, either above or below the mean.